Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor and privilege for me to be invited to this conference to speak in front of this wonderful assembly. With all of my heart, I would like to thank the the organizers of this conference, particularly the president of the Human Rights Foundation for inviting me to this conference so that I can share with you my personal experience in the defense of human rights. Before I speak of my organization and my activities, it is my duty to talk about the country where I came from. Chad is a country in the heart of the African continent. It covers 1,284,000 square kilometers and has a population of 9 million inhabitants. The principal sources of income are agriculture and farming. Since 2003, Chad has been a member of OPEC. This country has had more than 40 years of civil war and continues to be the stage of rebel invasions that undermine the peace that its own sons and daughters are so looking forward to. To come back to today's subject, I need to tell you that I am a lawyer in the Chadian bar and I preside over the Chadian Association for the Promotion of Human Rights. I was born in Chad, and I was orphaned at an early age. I was the first daughter of a Chadian doctor and a mother who was a nurse. Unfortunately, I was born three weeks after the passing of my father. Later, my mother passed away just as I turned 11. My organization is structured as a National Council of Management with an Executive Secretariat. There are also some specialized branches, a Commission for Women's Rights, a Commission for Children's Rights, and a judicial cell for research and documentation. We have sections, cells, and branches across 10 provinces of Chad. We also have a theater group to help us to educate people about human rights. The Chadian Association for the Promotion of Human Rights functions according to a three-tiered system. The thematic focus of our activities enables us especially to work with women, children, and prisoners. Regarding women, we work to protect their rights. But mostly we focus on the Levi Ra, which is a practice that considers women as possessions subject to being inherited or passed down after the death of their husband. This practice is extremely pronounced in the region in the center of Chad. Protection of the Chadian children is still a big problem in spite of the ratification by the Chadian government of the Relative Convention of Children's Rights. For the past few years, we have worked on a phenomenon that is constantly growing in the south of the country, a phenomenon of child shepherds. These children are between the ages of 9 and 13 years old and are sold for 10 euros by their parents to cattle herdsmen who need to people to drive their cattle into their pastures. Sometimes the herdsmen who purchase these children physically and forcefully tear them away from their parents. These children are poorly fed, if at all, and are not taken care of when they become sick. If one of their cattle becomes wounded, they wound the child. They push the mistreatment even further by killing them when they are disobedient to their masters or killing them when one of their animals dies. Some children are brought from the villages to be sold in the cities for domestic housekeeping. 
In the past two years, we have saved six children, two of whom live in my home, two live with the president of the Chadian Association for the Promotion of Human Rights, and two others have been placed with families. Unfortunately, efforts to raise money to create a shelter for these children have been fruitless so far. Concerning the prisoners, we periodically visit the jails and other detention centers. We produce reports on the condition of detention that we give to the competent authorities. We organize debates with prisoners on their rights and duties. We educate the jailers and the officers of judicial policies about the fundamental principles of human rights. After our visits to the jail of N'Djamena, we successfully worked to separate the men's and women's quarters, which had previously been joined. We envisioned the creation of a national observatory of jails. We have formed the boutiques de droit that offer free, jail consul free judicial consultations to the indigenous population. These offices are run by the Chadian Association for the Promotion of Human Rights, our organization. This is a summary of our organization's main activities, but there are many others, such as the formation of the target groups, sensitization, and of course, denunciation through press releases, open letters, and urgent appeals to the international community. The big thing is the fight against impunity, which remains the main preoccupation of the Chadian Association for the Promotion of Human Rights. Within the context of implementation of our activities, we have prioritized the fight against impunity. Impunity is rampant to this day. It is installed and maintained by the government. We have chosen to attack the Isan Bray affair, which is a typical example of impunity. Isan Bray was Chad's president for eight years. It was an eight-year reign of terror. He was ejected from power by a coup d'etat by Chadian president Idris Dibi who is the head general of the army and was in opposition of him. Under the reign of Isan Abre, there were unimaginable massacres. There were entire villages disseminated and many massive human rights violations. In December of 1990, he exiled himself to Dakar, Senegal, where he remains to this day. An investigation was ordered by the government in 1992 into, his reign, into the reign of Isan Abre. The report of the investigation shows 40,000 dead, thousands of missing people, and thousands of widows and orphans. We decided to open a judicial procedure in January of 2000 against Isana Bray in Senegalese and Belgian courts. We have been aided in our efforts by Human Rights Watch, the International Federation of the League for Human Rights, Amnesty International, and many other organizations. We are also working with victims who are associated with these organizations. These men and women are victims of unimaginable brutality perpetrated by the oppressive machine of Isan Abre. Our strategy is to operate on two fronts, the international front with personal lawsuits against Isana Bray and the domestic front 
with a national lawsuit against the accomplices of Isana Bray in the Chadian courts. Our efforts are particularly dangerous for the victims as Abre's accomplices are still in charge and hold very high ranks. There have been threats against me since 1998, the year we started thinking about this judicial procedure. The police descended upon me at home and subjugated me to a forceful interrogation. And these threats only grew bigger, such as, abandon your, this case or you'll lose your life. I was intimidated by these threats, and I talked about it to no one. I assure you, opting for this silence was the biggest mistake I made, because on June 11, 2001, these threats became a reality. On that day, I organized a peaceful rally and mobilized women of all kinds to denounce the presidential elections of May 2001, which were stolen. We wanted to officially denounce the election in an address to the French ambassador to Chad because we figured that France was closely involved in this electoral fraud. It was in front of the French embassy that a grenade was thrown at me by law enforcement officers and accomplices of Issan Abray. I was targeted by Issan Abre himself. Fifty grenades were then thrown to mask the offensive grenade under the pretext of crowd dispersion. Then I was under medical care in France for 15 months and have had four surgical operations. I live with a permanent handicap because grenade fragments remain in my body. My doctor tells me I'll have to integrate pain into my life from now on. I did dare to file a suit against the police officers who perpetrated this attack, but under pressure, the judges have greatly reduced the charges. It was very hard, but I had to accept it. Facing continued threats, I left Chad in February of 2008 during the rebel attacks in the capital of N'Djamena. Here also, my exile has been very labor-intensive. It is thanks to the work of the Canadian Consul and pressure exerted by Human Rights Watch and FDH on the French, French Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the French government that I was able to reach the French military base where I obtained refuge. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a brief description of my experiences in my role as a human rights defender. I cannot comment in the few minutes that I have on everything that we do, but during our breaks and meals, I can elaborate further on my experiences. I thank you very much.